the management of subscapularis is important component of anterior or deltopectoral open shoulder surgery. Uh, traditionally, a uh, subscapularis subscap tenotomy has been used to access the shoulder joint. The anterior approach to the shoulder can be used for a wide range of operations, including uh, reconstruction, drainage of the septic shoulder, biopsy, arthroplasty, and fixation of proximal humerus fractures. Uh, subscapularis dysfunction has been reported to be as high as 67% after open shoulder surgery. So the function of subscapularis, as you all know, it's one of the four rotator cuff tendons of the shoulder. Um, its main role is stability of the glenohumeral joint, um, but it's also a medial rotator. Depending on the position of the humerus, it may also abduct, adduct, or flex and extend the arm. Together with supraspinatus and infraspinatus, it opposes the action of deltoid during abduction to stop the humeral head rising up. Bit of the anatomy. So the subscapularis muscle um, and tendon. So the origin is the medial two thirds of the costal surface of the scapula and it inserts, uh, I thought everything inserted into the lesser trochanter but the review article mentions that the lower one third is a more muscular insertion that inserts into the metaphysis of the humerus directly below the lesser trochanter. It is supplied by the upper and lower subscapular nerves which are from the posterior cord of the uh, this is a picture from the article which showing the footprint of the tenderness and muscular insertion of the lesser into the lesser trochanter um, with the bicipital groove off to the left. Um, and this is a number of cada cadaver studies showing the variation in what people say is the size of the footprint. So a length anywhere from 24 to 60 millimetres, but a, a width that is quite consistent of about 18 millimetres wide. So some relationships of the subscapularis to other structures in the shoulder. The auxiliary nerve passes beneath the inferior margin um, before entering the quadrilateral space. Um, they mentioned that there's approximately 25 mil between the inferior border of subscapularis and the nerve and during abduction this gap um, reduces so the nerve is closer uh, to subscapularis during abduction. The upper subscapular nerve penetrates the muscle as close as one centimetre medial to the glenoid, so up here, uh, and all the subscapular nerves are in that line and they are reported as being at least 1.5 centimetres medial to the conjoint tendon and coracobrachialis and the, uh, the coracoid process is a good marker of the superior border of the subscapularis tendon and this may be particularly used with um, supraspinatus during the operation so it's a good landmark to use and the anterior humeral circumflex artery marks the inferior border. Yeah, which I thought would be unusual because I would have thought there's nothing actually in between. So visualising subscapularis during a deltopectoral approach, um, use those inferior and superior landmarks that I mentioned. Internal and external rotation may assist identification of the muscle. Um, and scarring of the clavopectoral fascia and conjoint tendon will obscure the tendon, so require a um, much more careful uh, debridement. Um, the authors talk about protecting the auxiliary nerve during the approach as it passes beneath the inferior margin of subscap. Um, they refer to it as being leashed by the anterior circumflex humeral vessels, um, and they say there's no reports of AVN from ligating it. Uh, those the nerve should be visualised 
and protect it at all times. Their preference is to put a blunt retractor between the muscle and the nerve and to continuously check on the um, health of the nerve during the operation. And they refer to um, doing an auxiliary nerve tug test, which involves having one finger sitting on the nerve and another finger sitting on the anterior fibres of deltoid and pulling on the deltoid muscle, which apparently gives you a tensioning of, on your other finger on the auxiliary nerve, meaning that is the auxiliary nerve connecting the deltoid and the um, nerve, and that it is intact. Uh, so here's some of the relationships I was talking about. So there's the uh, auxiliary nerve going under the subscapularis and brachial plexus here, which will have the subscapularis. Uh, so why is it why is subscapularis important again? Essentially, for a satisfactory post-operative -out outcome, poor results are associated with um, loss of internal rotation and loss of subscapularis. Tendon healing um, involves a variety of staging in stages including inflammatory stages, proliferative, reorganisation and remodelling. Um, strength of the, the tendon healing increases with each phase. The aims of repairing and looking after subscapularis is to replicate a normal tendon. Risk factors they mentioned for poor tendon healing include fatty infiltration of subscapularis and preoperatively and a tendon to bone repair as being a, a poor prognostic indicator. So uh, subscapularis tenotomy is the classic approach used. Um, the authors recommend if using this approach uh, to an incision one centimetre medial to the insertion of at the lesser tuberosity or alternatively one centimetre laterally to the musculotendinous junction. I think it should put you in a very similar spot. Depends what landmarks you're using. And they, again, this is to ensure that there's enough cut on the tendon um, for an adequate repair. Slice the capsule um, in turn or together, um, particularly for arthroplasty, and stay sutures should be used in the muscular part uh, to traction during the operation. And the repair should be anatomical with bone tunnels um, used to augment the repair if required. Um, some variation in this tenotomy, um, particularly for open glenohumeral instability joint surgery or reconstructive surgery, um, they recommend leaving intact the inferior portion of subscapularis, um, which may preserve proprioceptive fibres and the end. taking care to prevent capsular incision um, if performing this surgery. Capillaris tendon and then diatherming only. And potentially, if you can get into that layer, prevent doing it. Another technique that, that's mentioned in this article is the subscapularis peel. Um, which is stripping of the subscapularis from its insertion at the lesser trough, um, which can be useful for arthroplasty if you need to medialise the insertion after insertion if you have increased glenohumeral offset. During this, this repair definitely requires bone tunnels. Um, it's not recommended for instability surgery, and they don't recommend it as using as your primary uh, approach through subscapularis or your, as your primary route. Um, the lesser tuberosity osteotomy is something that they very much uh, point in this article. Um, it's the preferred technique of the senior author. Um, it requires an osteotomy of the uh, lesser form the Osteotomy, you need to tenderize tendinesis of the long head of biceps as the uh, osteotomy will sacrifice the medial wall of the bicipital groove and ligate the anterior humeral circumflexus. 
the osteotomy should be three to five centimeters long and five to ten millimeters thick. The advantages of the peel technique for particularly for internal rotation contracture they mention are bone to bone healing rather than tendon to bone healing and it doesn't disrupt the integrity of the subscapularis tendon. While both the peel technique and this technique allow for medialization of the subscap tendon. Um, um, and both these approaches may be augmented, augmented by an anterior capture release to improve external rotation it for internal rotation. Uh, the author's approach um, post arthroplasty um, for doing a repair involves drilling some holes through the lesser trochanter um, and grabbing your osteotomy, osteotomized bone and subscapular tendon and pinning it back down, but also wrapping the suture around the entire prosthetic, it around the humerus. Another approach um, that can be used for instability surgery um, is a subscapularis transverse split, where a split is made at the junction of the superior two thirds and inferior third in line with the muscle fibres. Again, this incision should not extend into the capsule, and they, they mentioned that the layers between the capsule and the subscap tendon are best defined at the muscular tendon's junction starting your incision there. And they weren't fussed if you were repaired this or how you would. Bed plasty lengthening is also mentioned uh, where after performing a complete tenotomy, um, if you're unable to get subscapularis back down to its original insertion site, uh, you can do a Z plasty to increase the length of the tendon and allow for less tension on your repair site and greater post-operative mobilisation. Um, this does reduce the thickness of the tendon and has poor biomechanical properties and therefore increases the risk of failure. So I think it's more of a get out of um, trouble type use of this approach. If, uh, So some biomechanics of the repair. Um, contraction forces of up to 250 newtons, which is equal to all three other rotator cuff muscles combined, um, go through the subscapularis tendon. In cadaver studies, transosseous tunnels and direct versus direct tendon on tendon repair um, provide more secure fixation. I'll just go over that a little bit again. So transosseous tunnels and, and direct tendon repair provide a more secure fixation than transosseous tunnels alone. Tendon to bone repair is associated with a higher failure rate than bone to bone and tendon to tendon repair. And the site of weak points include, with the suture repair, include the tendon suture junction and the tendon bone junction. When looking at instability uh, only, um, comparing, op comparing outcomes post open shoulder surgery for instability um, between tenotomy and subscapularis splitting technique, um, there was more fatty infiltration in the tenotomy group post operatively, which was performed on MRI, but, and better clinical results seen in the uh, subscapularis splitting group. Another article reported on the structural integrity and clinical function of the subscapularis after arthroscopic versus open shoulder stabilisation. All patients in the open group underwent a subscapularis tenotomy in which the inferior third was preserved. There was no clinical signs of subscapularis insufficiency after arthroscopic procedures. However, in 77 70% of patients who underwent an open subscapularis tenotomy 
prohibited clinical signs of insufficiency. Regarding arthroplasty in subscapularis tendon, very few studies assessing the function um, of the tendon postoperatively, and the majority are level four evidence. One thing is they, what they did say, they think they know for sure, without, again, without much study evidence backing it up, is that fatty infiltration preoperatively negatively influence strength, mobility and function postoperatively. And there is a poor correlation between subscapularis defects and commonly used screening tests, including the belly press test and the lift-off test. And there is also poor correlation between those tests and true function, i.e. tucking the shirt into the back of the um, in at the back. Um, didn't have a good correlation between positive and negative belly press tests. Regarding the repair, they say meticulous repair of the subscapularis is critical regardless of technique. The goals of a repair is a high initial fixation strength and a minimal gap formation at the interface, meaning an anatomical repair and mechanical stability until the healing is complete. The authors recommend a lesser tuberosity osteotomy technique. And there's a line in there about the potential of arthroplasty through the rotator interval between supraspinatus and subscapularis as a future technique for minimally invasive arthroplasty. In conclusion, uh, several options exist for the management of subscapularis. Uh, during open shoulder surgery. Management will depend on the type of operation, the quality of bone, the quality of tendon and the quality of muscle. Strong anatomic repair is critical. There is little evidence um, on technique of management of subscapularis over the other. Bone on bone repair or tendon on tendon repair will likely result in a much better outcome than tendon on bone.